man, what an awesome time of worship this morning. We're going to ask our kids to uh, check out of here and go have fun in, uh, in our G2 ministry this morning. Thank you guys so much for being here. We love having you worship uh, with our faith family and be a part of what God's doing here. So that's awesome. And as they're leaving church, we can celebrate the truth of God's word this morning. Matthew chapter 6, <laughs> verse 12. God has given us uh, his instruction on prayer, and we're discovering more and more about what it looks like to be people who pray as we are in this series called Let Us Pray. And so I want to just read one sentence again this week of what Jesus is teaching us. And so he says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we love you. And it's because of you that we're here. It's because you have been so good to us that you've blessed us in so many ways. But God, even beyond the blessings that you give to us, we're here because of who Jesus is. If you took everything away from our lives, God, we would still want to be in this place today because Jesus is so good. And so help us to remember today that, that you are the central focus of everything that we do and that we need more of you, that we want more of you. And I just want to ask you this morning, just take a second, and would you just have a moment that you communicate with God about maybe what you want to, uh, maybe what you need today. What do you hope God has for you in this moment? And just, just tell that to God. Just take a second to communicate with Him. And then would you take a second and ask God, to open your eyes to the things that he needs you to hear today, that he has to say to you. Father God, give us open hearts, give us open minds, and, uh, and help us to hear from you by the power of your Holy Spirit and through your word today. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus comes to this place in his prayer, and he's been teaching his disciples how to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so as we've been going through this prayer and learning more and more about what Jesus has to say, he gets to this place where he says, God, forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, I don't know what comes to mind when you think about debt. Uh, probably a lot of us have the same conception about debt, uh, that you've got something you're going, oh, that's, that's my house payment. That's my car payment. That's debt, right? Or uh, I've got credit card debt. I've got a situation here, and I owe Visa or MasterCard a lot of money, and so there's credit card debt, or uh, or maybe it's child support, and you're going, man, my, my debt comes in the form of, of I've got to pay child support in some way, and so there's all these different things that we think about. School loans may be a huge one for some of you. Maybe you guys that are in high school getting ready to graduate and go off to college, that's a concern for your near future, but you're paying off these debts, and so when Jesus tells us that we have the permission to ask God to forgive us our debts, we're going to talk about what that looks like, not necessarily from a financial standpoint as much as from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, but Heather and I were, were both blessed enough to have come through college and not had school debt. Uh, in fact, we've never really had what I would call crushing debt in our lives or in our marriage. Uh, we've had, we have a house payment, uh, and we have had at different times in our, our marriage car payments and those kinds of things. And, and so we understand what debt looks like. But I wouldn't say that there's been a time when we had really crushing debt or just major debt. Uh, the first time I really understood what that kind of debt looked like was at one of the churches that we served in. And, uh, and we knew going in that they had debt. We knew how much debt they had, and it still felt like God was kind of calling us into that place. But the amount of debt was one of these things that you just went, this is like crippling. Like the church was $13 million in debt. They had built this, this campus, and so it was an incredible thing that, that God had allowed them to do at a certain point, and, but the debt that they took on to do that almost felt crushing. I'm going to come back and tell a little bit more of that story in a little while, but that was the first time that I kind of felt the weight of going, how do you, how do you pay that off? What do you do with that? That is immense. Now, take something like that and compare that to our national debt, $20 trillion plus dollars that our nation's in debt. 
if you want to lose sleep tonight, go home and, and look up uh, usdebtclock.org uh, and just watch those numbers spin. Uh, it's phenomenal um, about what happens there. Did you know that every 10 seconds in our country, our nation goes $100,000 deeper in debt? Every 10 seconds, $100,000 deeper in debt. Just go watch that clock spin. <laughs> It'll keep you up tonight. All right. Um, but when you think about that, we start to look at that kind of debt and go, $20 trillion. How do I even wrap my mind around that? What does that even look like? How would you ever tackle that? And so Jesus alludes to this idea of debt, and that's exactly why he uses the term forgive us our debt as we also forgive our debtors. Jesus is bringing to mind a crushing weight that his audience would have understood. Jesus' audience was all too aware of the weight that debt could bring, right? So when we think about debt, even if it's a major annoyance in our life, in a lot of ways, debt is that. It's an annoyance. It's something that we go, okay, we're going to get creditor calls all the time. They're always going to be calling us. Or maybe somebody's going to come and, and repossess my car. Or I might have to file for bankruptcy. And I'm not taking any of those things lightly. If you're in that place, that is a difficult, hard place to be in. But in a lot of ways, it's a really incredible annoyance. To Jesus' audience, when he talked about debt in the Roman Empire, to have debt was worse than most crimes. To have any amount of debt could land you in prison until that debt was completely paid off. In fact, one of the commentaries that I read this week said that in the Roman prisons, there were more people who were debtors than criminals. Just think about that. It was an amazing difficulty in the life of a person to have debt because it would land you in prison, which would destroy your family. Now someone has to work off your debt until you can get out. It could destroy everything that you've ever had happen in your life. And so Jesus is talking to his audience and teaching them to pray. And he says, when you think about prayer, you think about forgiveness of sin like forgiveness of debt. He's invoking in their minds something that they're really familiar with. They knew what the crushing debt, uh, what the crushing amount of debt was that they had, and they knew that it, what it cost them. And so if you're taking notes this morning and want to follow along, here's the first thing that you can either write down or follow on the app. It just says this. Debt is meant to invoke in our minds both a serious offense and a corresponding serious punishment. And so Jesus says this debt that we have, it's a serious offense. To Rome, this is serious. If you have financial debt, it's serious. And there's a corresponding serious punishment to your debt, imprisonment. For the life of us as spiritual people, Jesus says, I want to take this concept of your, your financial debt and allude to this in the terms of spiritual debt. And I want you to see that in God's eyes, there is a huge, huge, serious offense to God that your debt, your sin debt causes. And as a result, there is a serious consequence. Your sin debt to God and his holiness carries with it a weight of consequence. And so Jesus is talking to his audience about all of these things, and he begins by teaching them next to say, as you pray, pray to your heavenly Father, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Here's the next thing on your outline. Jesus knows this about the broken nature of human relationships. We will sin against God, and we will sin toward people. Jesus knows this. He knows that we will sin against God and we will sin toward people. And so I want you to pay a close attention to those two words there because you go, okay, against God, towards people, what does that mean? I want you to see from Scripture how David thinks about this and how the Spirit of God directed him to write and pen something. In Psalm 51, verse 4, David wrote this, Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now, what's taking place at this time? David has just gone through a major tragedy in his life. He has committed a, a major sin, many major sins. Uh, David stayed home from war, and when he did, he looked out over his balcony, and he saw this woman who was bathing on her rooftop. And so he called her to the palace where he slept with her and impregnated her. And when he found out that she was pregnant, he's not married to her. She's someone else's wife. He calls that man home from the battle hoping that he'll go home and sleep with his wife so that he'll think that's his child. But this is a godly guy. 
And he doesn't. He refuses to go home. He says, if all the men are in battle, I'm supposed to be in war with them. I won't go home. So David sends him back to the battle with instructions for his commander. He hands the commander his instructions, and he doesn't know it, but he hands his commander his death warrant. The commander reads it, and it says, David tells him, put this guy on the front lines where the fighting is the worst, and when it gets bad, pull everyone back so he dies in battle. So now he's, he's uh, committed adultery, He's had a guy murdered. He's sinned against and toward the nation of Israel now because as the commander-in-chief, he should be protecting people, not leading them into death. And so he gives this guy his death warrant, and then when that all happens, David then just takes Bathsheba to be his own wife. And so all these sins start to pile up. And yet when David looks back on it and when God's Spirit convicts him of this sin, he says, God, against you and you only, have I sinned? How can David say that? Look at all the people he has sinned toward. And yet he says, and you know what? My sin is toward people, but it's against God. Because God is holy. He is the one that we sin against. We break his holy law. And so I want you to hear this quote from Charles Spurgeon. I love what he said. Because all sin is an affront to God and his holiness, Charles Spurgeon said, to injure our fellow man is sin, mainly because in so doing, we violate the law of God. We sin toward people, but it violates the law of God. Mankind is made in the image of God. So when we sin toward one another, we're breaking an ordinance of command of God and his holiness and his sovereignty. So he says, I've sinned against God because all men are made in God's image but against you and you only have I sinned. And so because all sin is committed against God, Jesus says we need to start by asking him to forgive our debts. That's the starting point. And so God, I, before I start asking you to help other people or, or bring forgiveness to someone else or help me to forgive someone else, I'm going to start with God. Will you forgive my sins? Because all sin is committed against God. We need to go to him first and ask him to forgive our sin. And the language of debt is used to cause us to think about and feel the weight of our sin debt against God and His holiness. Um, if you have a large amount of debt, $50,000, $500,000, can you imagine going to your bank or calling your credit card company and going, hey, um, I know I've got all this debt. I know it's immense. I, and probably it's going to take me forever, if ever, to pay it back. Um, how would you feel about just canceling that? Probably not going to happen, right? And yet Jesus says when we come back to God, we have permission to ask him, hey, forgive us of our sin. Forgive us of our debt. Let me pick back up with the church story that I was talking about a little while ago, the $13 million of debt. God actually did a very incredible thing in that. We realized as a church that that was our debt to take responsibility for. And so we went to our bank and we said, it's, it's our responsibility to pay off all of this debt. And we, we are putting a plan in place to make sure that we pay off all of this debt. It's ours and we're going to pay it all. We feel like God is telling us to pay every penny of the debt that we have. The bank in reply said, here's what we want to do. We want to let another bank take your debt because <laughs> we don't want it. But here's what we're willing to do. We're going to give you three years. In three years, if you can pay $3 million, we'll forgive an additional $3 million. In three years, we had the chance to eliminate $6 million of debt. And praise be to God, the church did. But guess what that meant? We still had $7 million of debt. See, here's the next thing on your outline. You are a debtor until all of your debt is paid. You are a debtor. No matter how much your debt shrinks, no matter how great a miracle God does to bring things to a smaller point, to get payments under control, to put you back in a better place, you are still a debtor until all debt is paid. And so as Jesus talks about this, we need to understand being completely out of debt is the only way to find true freedom. And that's why the purchase for us as a church, the purchase of this building, is something that we want to aggressively pay off the debt that we have incurred here. So that's why we're putting a plan in place and asking the church to pray and ask God to help us eliminate the debt of this church and this building in five years because we want to get out from underneath that. But here's what I want us to understand as I'm talking about this, that Jesus is not talking about financial issues. 
He's using a financial picture to bring up a spiritual point. And so while for us, when we hear the word debt, we always go to money, and he knew his audience would do that, the main picture he's bringing to mind is that we have another debt that we can't pay. We have another crushing debt, a soul-crushing debt. It's a sin debt against our Heavenly Father. We harbor sin in our hearts against God. He is a holy, righteous, eternal, good God. And yet we sin against him. We break his commands. We break his code. We break and we violate his holiness all the time. So when we think about the sin debt, our sins require payment. In the same way that your financial debt requires payment to pay it off, your sin debt requires a payment. Now, in the Old Testament, God had devised a way for his people to live in relationship with him and to have their sins committed or to have their sins forgiven. And it was the, the old covenant under the law was to have an animal sacrifice. And so you would bring your animals to the temple and you would sacrifice them for your sins. And the blood of those animals would stand in your place before God. And God would say, as you have killed that animal, it's taking on your sin so that your punishment that you deserve is being placed on that. And God saw that in the same way that he would see you giving yourself as punishment for sin. And so God put the sin of, of mankind on the animals. In fact, Hebrew says, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. So there has to be a sin debt that's paid through the shedding of blood. But in the New Testament, in our context, Jesus said, I, or God said, I want to give you a new and a better covenant. One that doesn't require perpetual sacrifices, one that doesn't require annual sacrifices, one that doesn't require the, the continued sacrifice of animals. I'm going to send my son, the Lamb of God, who's going to come to take away the sins of the world. And so God said, here's the new covenant of my blood. I'm going to send Jesus. Jesus came. He lived a perfect life. He was our spotless lamb, our sinless sacrifice. And when Jesus went to the cross, his blood, his death became our atonement to make us right with God. And so God says, when I see Jesus on the cross, I see him taking your sin, the sin that you committed. I've placed it on Jesus and the punishment that you deserve, I'm placing it on him. The crucifixion is God's punishment against sin. He poured out the cup of his wrath on Jesus at the cross so that you and I don't have to take the wrath of God. And so when we see this, we understand that Jesus has took our place. But here's what we need to know, that the debt that we have against God is not a debt we can pay on our own. You can't be good enough. You can't work hard enough. You can't do anything on your own to pay off your sin debt. Remember the question that I asked earlier? Can you imagine going to your bank and asking them just to forgive your debt? It's unlikely, right? To go in and go, I've got $25,000 of debt. How about you just wipe it off your ledger? Now, let's put that same thing into principle and into practice in our relationship with God. The sin debt that you have toward God, can you imagine the soul-crushing sin debt and you walking into God's courtroom and going, okay, God, um, Here's the thing. There's no way I can pay for this sin. I, I know I'm deserving of punishment. I know that I can't do this on my own. God, would you just, would you just forgive it, my sin? And I just want you to imagine walking in front of God like that and him going, oh, let me see. Let me pull up my ledger. Um, it looks like, oh, yeah, you've done some pretty terrible things. And uh, wow, uh, some of these sins, man, creative, uh, good job. Um, Oh, you know what? Down here at the bottom, I'm, let me see this. There's a note here that this sin debt that you have, all these terrible things you've done, this has already been paid for. It, it's already been taken care of. And he looks at his ledger and he goes, I've wiped out sin here because Jesus already paid for this. That's the power of the gospel. That's the good news that we have as Christians. And if you're not a Christian today, this is good news for you to hear that you have the same opportunity to accept the forgiveness that God issues to you and offers to you. Because God says to you, look, all of the sins you've committed in your life, every terrible thing you've done, everything you will do in the future, it's all been paid for. 
You just have to accept the gift of forgiveness. And when you come to God and you say, God, I, I need you to forgive this. I can't take care of it on my own. I can't pay for it. I can't make up for all that I've done against you. He's going to look at you and say, you don't have to. That's why I sent my son. That's what Jesus is for. He gives you freedom. He offers you forgiveness. So you can come to God and you can say, forgive us of our debts because he has and he desires to. Here's the next thing on your outline. Because God has forgiven us of an unimaginable debt, that also makes us free to forgive other people. I mean, think about it. Because you've been forgiven, it frees you up to also be forgiving. Isn't that amazing? That when you think about the people who've wronged you in your life, that the gospel is, because Jesus has forgiven you, you can and should forgive other people. And we aren't saved. I think this is an important thing for us to get because Jesus says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That doesn't mean that God, because I've forgiven people who owe me a debt, they sinned against me or towards me and I harbor ill will toward them. But because I've forgiven them, you should now forgive me because I earned it. I deserve it. I forgave people, so you should forgive me. That's putting things in the wrong order. He's saying, God, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, we're going to be forgiving people because you've forgiven us our debts. It's a response to the forgiveness that God offers to us. That because he's forgiving and loving and gracious and kind, we can do those same things toward other people. And so there's a passage of scripture and a story that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. And Jesus begins the story and he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle debts with his servants. That's an important place just to stop for a second because I love how Jesus starts this story. He gives us this imagery of a king who wants to settle debts. In other words, there will come a day of reckoning that the debt that you owe toward God will come to pass where he's going to come to you and say, we've got to settle up. And, and you're either going to be able to say, uh, I want to settle this because of what Jesus has done on my behalf, or you're going to have to say, all of this sin in my life, I'm going to have to try to find a way for you to, to make this go away, God, and, and based on how I've acted in my life and what I've done in my life. But there will come a day where the settling of debts is going to occur. So he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a, a king who wants to settle debts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that they had be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I'll pay back everything. And the servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Can you imagine? Here's a guy that comes in and goes, 10,000 bags of gold. Maybe your, your Bible says uh, 10,000 talents. Uh, a talent was equal to about uh, 20 years' wages. So imagine 10,000 talents. That's getting up into like you now are going to have to work for me for millions of years, right? And so you can't possibly pay this off. And so the king looks at this guy and goes, okay, here's the deal. I'm just going to forgive it. You're forgiven. You don't owe me 10,000 bags of anything, you can just go. Wow. How would you feel in that moment if you had just been forgiven that kind of crushing debt off of your life? How would you feel? Let's see what happens with the guy. Verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. That's about a day's wages. So less than a year of debt, a hundred days of debt to pay off. And he grabbed the man. He began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me. I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar? Verse 30, but he refused. And instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay off the debt. And when the other servants of the king saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant back in. You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in his anger, his master handed over to the jailers to be tortured 
until he should pay back all he owed. And this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Listen, this isn't a story about a, about a man who gained salvation and then he went away and he did something bad and then he was brought back to the king and the king took his salvation away. This is about a man who was offered salvation. Your debts will be completely paid. And he took that part. Hey, that sounds great. But when he went away, he doesn't act as if he is saved because of the salvation that's come to him from the forgiveness of debts. He begins to punish other people for the debt they still hold against him. He's not lost his salvation. He never had it in the first place. Because he didn't take what was offered to him, forgiveness, and put that into practice toward other people. And so Jesus says in this analogy, in this parable, he says in his anger, his master handed that man over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. How long do you think it was going to take him to pay back two million years worth of debt? He's never going to get out, right? Jesus is essentially saying, look, if you're offered forgiveness by the Father and you don't take that to heart and you don't accept that forgiveness and then you don't live that out as your Christian faith to forgive others, it's, not, it's nothing to you. You don't have forgiveness from Jesus if you're not willing to express that forgiveness to other people. Take it and celebrate in it and rejoice in it that God has forgiven your debt. He's forgiven your sin debt so that you're now free to go and forgive others. So the next thing on your outline, because we've been forgiven much, we should be willing to forgive extravagantly. Because you've been forgiven so much. Be willing to forgive extravagantly. Peter came to Jesus one time, and he had a, for instance, <laughs> Jesus, let's just say that there's a guy who sins against me. How many times should I forgive him? Jesus, should I forgive him seven times? Like Seven, wow, that's a lot. And you just imagine Jesus going, wow, Peter, seven. I mean, seven, Peter, good, man, it's awesome. Peter, how about... You forgive someone who sins against you or sins toward you 70 times seven times. I'm not good at math, but I think that's 490 times. All right, so he's going, look, this is not about a number. This is about saying be extravagant in your forgiveness towards people. You have been forgiven more than you can ever possibly know. So be extravagant in the way that you forgive others. Not seven times, 490 times, if that's what it takes. Keep forgiving, Peter. Keep offering forgiveness. But I want you to look back at how the parable that Jesus told ends. He says we're to forgive from our hearts. So how do you know if you've forgiven someone? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Okay, I want to be forgiving. I believe I'm supposed to be forgiving, but how do I know if I've truly forgiven someone? Because sometimes things still pop up in my head about that person, and I don't know if I'm still harboring a grudge, harboring bitterness, harboring anger. Did it just pop back up, or do I, have I forgiven them, or am I still holding on to that sin that they've committed against me, that debt they have? So how do I know if I've forgiven someone? Well, here's what Jesus said in Matthew 15. He said, out of the overflow of the mouth, or out of, excuse me, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so essentially what I would say is if, if you can think about having forgiven someone in your heart, because Jesus said, forgive someone from your heart. So how do I know if I've done that? How do you talk about those people now? How do you communicate about that person? Do you speak about them with love, compassion, kindness? Look, they don't have to become your very best friend. But are you cordial about them? Do you speak about them in loving tones? Or when, you when they come to your mind, do you still talk about them as if they're the bad guy who hurt you? Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So forgive someone from your heart. And when you do, you'll know that you've done it because of the way you talk about them. So here's the question. Why is it important to not only be forgiven by Jesus, but also to extend forgiveness to others? And if you're following along, taking notes, here's what you can write down. God is a merciful, forgiving God. And his kingdom is inhabited by disciples who share those characteristics. God is a loving, merciful, generous, forgiving God. And his kingdom is inhabited by Christians, by disciples who share those characteristics. That's what God's looking for in his church. 
So remember, and Andy talked about this earlier this morning, how do we define a disciple? Matthew 4.19 says, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So we talk about being a disciple of Jesus as someone who's following Jesus, who's being changed or transformed by Jesus, and who's on mission with Jesus. That's what we believe the Bible says it means to be a disciple. And so in this idea of having our debts forgiven and being forgiving people, disciples are people who are being changed by Jesus to seek forgiveness of sins and then also to forgive others. And this is a work that Jesus has to do in your life. It's not something that comes naturally to you. It's unnatural to us as humans to just willingly forgive people. And it's unnatural for us to accept forgiveness a lot of times. Think about it from your role as a parent, if you've been in that place before. Your kids, somebody does something against them, and what do we do as parents? We get down on our knee in front of our kid and go, okay, now, you need to accept his apology, and you need to tell him what? I forgive you, right? We do that as parents because our kids go, no, no, no. He made me mad. He hurt my feelings. He did something against me. I am not forgiving him. But as parents, we teach our kids Hey, someone wrongs you. There's a debt that's to you. You need to accept their apology. You need to offer your forgiveness. And so this is the work that God does in the life of a disciple, that he changes us. Jesus is parenting us toward spiritual maturity. He's leading us to grow in our life as disciples. He's changing us by saying, you can come to the Father and you can ask for forgiveness and know it's been given. And then once you know that and as you accept that forgiveness and you live as a follower of Jesus, offer forgiveness to others. The forgiveness you gain from God is not something to keep to yourself. You offer it to others. And so we have to learn that. And this kind of forgiveness this has something to play into our church and, and the mission of our church as well. This prayer for forgiveness of our own sins and learning to forgive others doesn't just make an impact on our personal lives. It affects who we are as a body, as a faith family. Because here's what we believe and what we know. Nobody in this church is perfect. You act like it sometimes. I do. But none of us are. None of us are perfect. And if we're not perfect, then that means that we've caused problems with other people. And that means that we have problems between us and our relationship with God. And so we're not going to act like we're perfect, and we're not going to expect anyone else to be perfect, which means that we need to be a community of faith that holds out and offers forgiveness a lot. Because we're going to do things to hurt each other's feelings. We're going to do things to wrong one another. And so we have to be willing to ask for forgiveness, and we need to be willing to give forgiveness. And so that's going to be a part of what our culture is looking for. What's going, to, what's going to help us as a church reach our culture? People are looking for an authentic community to belong to. They want to know they don't have to be perfect and that their mistakes aren't going to be looked at and scrutinized and held under the microscope and that everybody else in the room is and they're the only ones who don't have their stuff together. If we're an authentic community, we're going to be honest about our faults. We're going to be honest about our sins. We're going to be honest about the sin debt we have. And we're going to ask for forgiveness, and we're going to forgive others. And I believe that's going to be so appealing to this community that people are going to want to be around a faith family like that. So here's what I want to leave you with this morning. Just some next-level action steps, two things really to think about. And as we leave from here and go out this week to go, okay, what do I do? How's this play out? Number one, seek God's forgiveness. Seek God's forgiveness. And the first way that I want to do that, I want to talk to two groups of people really quickly. If you're not a follower of Jesus, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord, as your Savior, if you've never asked for your sins to be forgiven, the first way you seek forgiveness is by asking for salvation. That you go to God just like the illustration I used earlier, and you just say, there's no way I can make this right. I can't work hard enough. I can't be good enough. I can't do enough nice things. I don't even know where to begin. But God, would you forgive me anyway? Would you cancel my debt? And the good news is that you can go into that conversation confidently. It's not like calling Visa and going, hey, that $170,000 that I owe you, would you just wipe that off? And then you're kind of going, I don't know what they're going to say. No, you do know what they're going to say. They're going to say no. You don't have to worry about that in this conversation you have with Jesus. He's already said yes. 
the cross is yes to you. So if you don't know Jesus as Savior and you're carrying around the weight of your sin, he wants to take it off of you. And this morning can be that time that you just say, God, I want you to forgive me. I need your forgiveness of my sins. And I ask for you to change my life. And if you do that, I would even invite you and encourage you to take a next step tonight. We have a baptism service tonight at 6.30 at the YMCA. I'd love to talk with you this afternoon, talk about faith, what it looks like. But if you genuinely want to place your faith in Jesus today, you can be baptized tonight. And it's a life-changing process to enter into this relationship with Jesus. So the first thing, prayers for salvation. Here's the second thing, prayers for restoration. We pray and ask God for restoration. In the same way that your marriage or your relationship with your kids, there's often times that we have angry conversations with each other. It doesn't mean when my wife and I have a fight that we're not married anymore. It just means that I have to go back with flowers. <laughs> and ask for forgiveness to restore what was broken. In the same way, as Christians, we are going to continue to sin. There's going to occasionally be breaks in that relationship, tears in that relationship between us and God. He is holy, and he has called us to be holy. And so there's times that we have to go back to God and go, God, I'm sorry. I need you to forgive me. I need to ask for forgiveness not for salvation a second time, but for restoration. I know I've offended your holiness. Would you restore me to the joy of my salvation? And so you think about a passage from Psalm chapter 19, verse 12 through 14. David wrote and said, But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. He says there's two kinds of sins you have in your life occasionally. There are willful sins that you know you do. And then there's also times you have hidden faults. And so this prayer of restoration sometimes is us going to God and going, God, I blew it in this specific area and I know what I did. Will you please forgive me? Other times it's, God, I don't even know if what I did was wrong or not. I'm, I'm feeling conviction from your Holy Spirit, and so I'm coming to you and asking you, will you forgive my hidden sins? Those hidden faults, those things that I'm not even aware that I did that offended you in your holiness, would you forgive those? So prayers for restoration. Here's the last one. Offer forgiveness to someone who's in your debt. Offer forgiveness to someone who's in your debt. This is the action step this week, and when I say that, most of us in this room probably will not have to spend very much time thinking about who is it that owes you a debt. In fact, you probably already have the name that popped into your head. Will you today, don't delay, don't put it off. Will you today make that phone call, drop by somebody's house, set up a meeting for coffee, whatever it is you need to do to make a relationship right? to extend forgiveness to someone who's hurt you. And just say, I've been forgiven extravagantly, and I want to forgive extravagantly. That's the picture of the body of Christ. That's the picture of us as disciples of Jesus who have been transformed to be like him, to hold out forgiveness to those who have wronged us. So take that step today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we ask and pray in these moments that we have together this morning that you will help to continue to shape us, to guide us, to change us, to be more like you. And, uh, and Father, I pray for those that this morning, they don't have a relationship with you, but today is the day that, that comes for them for salvation. They've heard clearly that salvation is a free gift available to them. God, I just pray and ask that you would transform people's hearts today. And if you're in the room this morning hearing that message and you want to give your life to Jesus today, please come and see me after the service. I'm going to be out in the gathering area. I want to talk to you, share with you a little bit more about what this faith journey looks like. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who love you, who know you, but who have someone in their life that they need to forgive. I pray that they'll take the chance to do that today and that you'll be glorified in it. We love you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.